panel starts in five minutes. The panel starts in five minutes.
Okay, welcome back everyone. We're just gonna wait a second. Can people who are trying to move in come towards the light? Um, okay, brilliant. So welcome everyone uh, to this panel, Security Architecture in Europe after the war in Ukraine. And I'm delighted to announce the panel, if they can just start making their way on. It's Stefan Lehner, Thomas Kreminger, uh, Carson Fries, and uh, Ivana Drajicevic. Uh, unfortunately, Martha can't join us, um, but she sends her best wishes. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Pronunciation was excellent, <laughs> considering Absolutely. then for two days you've been, you know, struggling with all different, you know, first and last names. Thank you. Uh, welcome to you all. I know it's been long two days, but I think we have very important subjects, security architecture in Europe after the war in Ukraine. So I'll jump straight in. Uh, we'll start maybe with Thomas. Uh, how do you see the situation at the moment? When will this war finish? And what are the stakes at the moment? How did this war basically already change Europe's position towards its own security architecture? I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, so I think for the time being, what we can do, we can work with uh, scenarios. Uh, and, and the same is obviously valid for what is going to happen afterwards. Uh, it, it is obvious that uh, the, the kind of end of the war uh, that we will uh, witness will shape uh, the future architecture of, European, uh, of the European peace and security order. We uh, uh, at my center work currently with four scenarios. Uh, the most probable is a continuation of a uh, high intensity uh, conflict as we see it uh, currently. For how long? Um, well, uh, at least until uh, and both sides clearly um, seem uh, to have, uh, um, you know, this, this, um, to speak with Bill Sartman, this mutually hurting stalemate mm -hmm. uh, is clearly still far away uh, from the current situation. Both sides uh, are convinced that they can improve their negotiation position by military gains. I think for, uh, on the Russian side, it's clearly uh, they want to have full control over the Donbass. Uh, um, probably now, after these annexations, uh, again, over the entire annexed territory. At the same time, on the Ukrainian side, there have been uh, you know, these uh, massive uh, territorial gains recently. So there is a sense that uh, you know, uh, occupied ter ter territories can be liberated. So I think uh, there are strong arguments that we will see a continuation of this high-intensity high war. At some point, this might turn into uh, something that is more of a low-intensity uh, uh, conflict, uh, a bit similar to what we have seen since 2014 mm -hmm. in the Donbass, obviously with a, a line of contact further to the west certainly with a lot more resistance in, in the occupied territory, with a weak ceasefire or without a ceasefire. Um, I think a, a, a third scenario that I could uh, you know, envisage is an escalation, an es escalation uh, in terms of uh, um, a territorial uh, a military operation, for instance, by the Russian Federation uh, towards uh, Odessa and Transnistria, nuclear, implementing uh, this Nova. Sorry, to interrupt your nuclear still on the table. Exactly. I'm, 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 you know, this escalation scenario has, for me, uh, different potential elements. One is a, a, a territorial move. Um, a second would be um, uh, still conventional, but aiming at also strategic energy infrastructures. Right now, uh, Russians are only targeting uh, small to medium-sized energy infrastructures in Ukraine. Here, you could escalate. And then, uh, I think, uh, uh, cyber is clearly something where we haven't seen. You know, the big cyber attack hasn't happened yet. That's a possible escalation, escalatory move. And then, uh, I think, uh, when it comes to the nuclear, it's highly unlikely 
but you cannot totally exclude it. I think um, if uh, there is a perception uh, by President Putin uh, that his country is about uh, uh, to uh, suffer a strategic defeat, I wouldn't totally exclude it. But again, it's highly, highly unlikely. And the fourth scenario, and, and let me also mention this one, because this is, uh, 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 of course, the one scenario that I think many of us, uh, you know, would, uh, uh, would opt for is a negotiated end of the conflict, uh, a negotiated end that would certainly have to deal with the future status and uh, combined with security guarantees, that would have to deal with the territorial issues, which are of course now much more complicated after the annexations, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it might also have to do uh, with war crimes and reparations. Uh -huh. Stefan, what has already changed? You can pick up on this, but what has already changed in, you know, Europe's security policy and our interior and architecture towards the outside world with this war? Well, I think this panel is by far the most ambitious one of all panels. <laughs> Just imagine we, uh, there would be a think tank conference in December two, 1914 about the end <laughs> post World War I architecture. It's sort of a crazy notion, basically. Because uh, you can imagine all sorts of things. You could imagine a very strong and confident uh, Ukraine coming out of this war, pushing towards NATO and EU membership. Uh, you can also imagine in very weak uh, uh, basket case Ukraine that is sort of dependent on aid, uh, probably crippled, losing some of its territory, not real viable. You can imagine a Russia that is uh, going on, building its empire, again, attacking the north of Kazakhstan. You can see uh, Russia imploding, basically, with Dagestan and Chechnya applying for EU membership. So <laughs> <laughs> the imagination is it's quite open. What has already changed? Uh, I think we have sort of one big, huge focus of EU security policy now. And I think uh, I'm mainly talking about the EU, because that's what I know about, is uh, Josep Borrell has said this is the birth of the geopolitical Europe. But you can also say this is the relapse to the kind of benevolent American hegemony. Because uh, I think the EU had always huge troubles dealing with Russia, because it was very divided. There were the Baltic states, the P Poland, hugely skeptical, uh, they proved to be right <laughs> eventually, and there were other countries like my own Austria, Italy, Greece, and many others who were very proud of having very good relations with Russia. The reasons why we were able to agree this time was for two factors. One was Vladimir Putin, because he did something so crazily uh, aggressive that even the greatest putin versteher fell into line. There was really no alternative. And the other factor was Joe Biden, because I think without strong EU leadership on, uh, EU's leadership on this issue, we wouldn't have been so united. But the problem that I see is that this EU coherence, which we achieved, which we are rightly proud of, I think showing signs of erosion. Because the longer the war continues, the higher the collateral damage, the more you will have a new sort of divide opening up between the countries who believe there is only one outcome that is acceptable, and that is the victory, clear-cut victory of Ukraine, and the others who feel, well, what we really need is a ceasefire tomorrow, mm -hmm. regardless of what that means in terms of implications for the future of the Ukraine. And uh, my worry is the longer this lasts, the difficult it, more difficult it will be to maintain this uh, coherence among the EU mm. countries. Mm. You mentioned Mr. Borrell. I just have to explain my outfit. I'm kind of playing Borrell's jungle here, so please mm. bear with me mm. with my monkeys and philodendrons, because jungle is also a place where life is uh, growing uh, every day. Uh, Carsten, to pick up on Stefan said, we had strategic compens. We now have this uh, uh, more united approach towards common security and defense in European Union, especially by bridging the uh, defense investment gap, which was huge. We can talk about the numbers, but I don't know if this is the time and place concerning the uh, time we have. Are you an optimist? Uh, optimist is a difficult word these days because mm -hmm. of the war. Um, but let me also start with repeating what's been said in other panels. This, this war is about the security architecture, or the protect the security architecture we have in Europe. Uh, and that's what it boils down to, it's about human rights, it's about states' freedom to choose what kind of security and foreign policy orientation they want. 
versus the Russian version where the big powers decide on behalf of the smaller ones. So the war is about the security architecture. Uh, we don't need to change it, we need to strengthen it. Uh, I would love to comment on Thomas' scenarios here, but, but uh, briefly, I'm a bit more optimistic when it comes to the, to the war. I, I think, well, I think the war will continue till Ukraine has liberated its territories or have concluded that it has reached what it needs to do to, to reach. I think Russia will, it's militarily very weakened and extremely, uh, surprisingly weak militarily and will continue to to face defeats in the, in the months, and, and months ahead of us. Provided, of course, that we continue to provide military support, um, that the sanctions work, and as Stefan said, that we stay united. Of course, that's our Achilles heel, that we can manage to stay together in the, in the West. But so far, the unity that Putin has brought to the West's transatlantic community is, is not, <laughs> nothing we could do ourselves, uh, ironically enough. Uh, we saw here in this clip that Europe for the first time basically, uh, how to say, launched this European uh, peace mechanism and uh, the way basically to provide heavy armory to, to, to other nations. Uh, Transatlanticism was a key guarantee of security in Europe, still is basically, and we are now seeing what a discrepancy is uh, in, in the number and amount of arms that are being uh, given to Ukraine from the US and from the Europe. How do you see this bond in terms of you know, future scenarios for Europe's security architecture, concern, considering maybe we can put into this equation also and political disturbances and disturbances for our democracies, because one of the uh, uh, um, points is this war, as Mr. Putin is saying, it is a war of values also. So maybe you can start. Right now, uh, I think uh, there is this uh, uh, unity uh, uh, and I uh, think uh, uh, th this has been uh, very important and, and also uh, perhaps also very surprising mm -hmm. to President Putin that uh, there is this unity um, on, on the Western side. Um, if we look to the medium long term uh, and, and, you know, if uh, the war would uh, drag on, would escalate, uh, I'm not so sure that, you know, not one of the scenarios that we should uh, also uh, uh, count with uh, would be a fractured Europe where this uh, um, solidarity breaks apart. Mm -hmm. um, but for the time being, uh, clearly, uh, this is not the case. Um, and, uh, and, and, and clearly, I mean, you asked before, uh, what is the impact of, of the European security order? Well, it is now dominated by one uh, uh, unique uh, uh, concept, and that is deterrence, you know. So uh, uh, all cooperative elements uh, of the European security order, uh, as it uh, developed after the end of the Cold War, have uh, disappeared, and, and of course, the, the big question is, and, and again, this will depend on the outcome of the war, will they reappear uh, at some point in some form? Nuclear was part of the concept of deterrence, the balance we now see and hear that this, I call them new nukes, are arriving uh, in Europe. It's regulary procedure, but in this kind of uh, friction and tension, it raises uh, an alarm. Uh, talking about deterrence and talking about, uh, let's say, nuclear balance of power uh, in the world concerning that, you know, start has been prolonged, concerning that we will at some point need to have some kind of sitting on the table, hopefully, if we hope to that scenario. Uh, how do you see uh, this part of, of security architecture of Europe, so nuclear part? Well, I think one of the very worrying things about the situation is that in recent years, or long before the uh, Ukraine war, uh, war started, uh, the whole arms control uh, system basically started falling apart, eroding, and uh, I think mainly this is also the responsibility of, of Russia and Putin, but not exclusively. I think there was simply uh, less and less interest in this, less and less cooperation. And we have to remember that these, uh, many of these treaties were negotiated at the time of high tensions between East and West. Uh, it was possible to cooperate on this particular, uh, in this particular area, 
because it was seen as a shared priority. And the fact that this is no longer there is very scary, basically. I, I think, uh, ultimately, people will have to return to the table and start to renew these structures, but we're clearly not there yet, because while the war is going on, there is simply no bandwidth for any of these sorts of things. And I think, as Thomas was right, that we are now united between the US and Europe, and in a way, uh, this war has been much better for NATO than it was for the EU, basically. And uh, the fact that Sweden and Finland decided to apply to join NATO is not a vote of confidence in European defense policy, I think. We have to be very open about this. But there's this huge question mark, and that regards the future of, of the U.S. commitment to Europe. I think we are going to have elections in November. We'll have elections in 2024. Mr. Trump is considering coming back. We know what he thinks about NATO, what he thinks about the European Union. He said the EU is an enemy, basically. So I, I think it's very wise uh, if uh, Europe doesn't put all its eggs into the NATO basket, if mm -hmm. the EU at the same time tries to develop military capabilities uh, for autonomous action, because we cannot, at this stage, fully rely that the American commitment to the European security will continue. And also, the final point is China, of course. I think mm -hmm. even if Biden is re-elected, the moment will come when the Americans will tell us, uh, we've been in the lead on Ukraine, we have done much more than you did, we provided leadership, but now our real problem is China and Ukraine, over to you. And I think this will be a dramatic challenge for us. Uh, Can I? Uh, yes, sorry, please. I just want to comment on, the, please, please. on the, uh, the problem is that we are so dependent on American military leadership. I'm talking about hard security here. Not, uh, I mean, even if Europeans agree today that we're going to have a strong united military force, uh, I don't know who should lead it, France, the UK, Germany, uh, but <laughs> that aside, even if we decided today, it will take 10 to 20 years to build it. So, so we have, there is no alter, plan B alternative, even if we had Trump in president or, in, or some kind of like a Trump thing. And that's our challenge. There, there, there is no, on the hard security, there is no alternative. So, so, and to be frank, actually the military spending of the United States when Trump was president actually went up. That was probably despite of him, not because of him, because they didn't know and there were the elders in the room and all this, this you know, the, the establishment. But nonetheless, um, we, we don't have much choice, really. That's the problem. Uh, and then we can dream about strategic autonomy and, and doing things in Europe, but we're so far away from being there. And that's what scares me a little bit. Do you think the same, that we don't have much choices? Or? Well, right now, the situation indeed looks very bleak. And, and I, I said before, for me, the most... Uh, likely uh, scenario is a continuation of a high intensity conflict right now but uh, i think uh, you know at some point we will have to uh, this war will come to an end the question is of course to what kind of an end and and then uh, we will have to uh, 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 try hard to get uh, to a security order that again includes you know some cooperative uh, elements um, and, and as Stefan rightly said, I mean, it's not the time yet uh, for, for this, but it's perhaps the time to think about it, you know, what uh, happens if, uh, you know, the, uh, a political environment evolves uh, that would again allow uh, uh, the, the reintroductions of things like military risk reduction, confidence and security uh, building measures. Um, I, I also like to point, you know, to this very substantive uh, American negotiation offer that was put forward end of January this year uh, as a formal response to the two treaty, uh, Russian treaty proposals. Mm -hmm. I mean, if at some point uh, the political situation allows to re, uh, relaunch that package, I mean, this would be uh, a significant way forward. Also, uh, an important step in, in, in trying to rebuild, you know, that arms control architecture that provided us for, uh, with quite some uh, uh, stability uh, since the end of the Cold War. Uh, you mentioned earlier that Europe still 
we, we still haven't experienced some huge scale or large scale cyber attack. But talking about hybrid threat, talking about psychological warfare, and talking about, I have to, because it, it really stuck into my mind, this value war thing uh, that Putin is advocating. So uh, this is also part of our security architecture to think about. Uh, if we have Europe, which basically doesn't have its own uh, digital infrastructure in that regard, AI companies, social media, doesn't have its own Google, doesn't have its Elon Musk, I have to put him out here because of what happened yesterday. Uh, what kind of security resilience in that regard from our minds, if we talk about psychological architectures of Europeans of the future, can we think of? Well, if you look at uh, the EU's external relations in general, I think one must say they were developed in a very different world, uh, in a way that looks rather naive now. Basically, ex economic relations were seen as win-win situations, where everybody will gain automatically. But we live in a time of geopolitics, in a, we live in a time of the weaponization of everything, basically. And, and clearly, uh, cyber plays a huge role in this regard. And I think in this different context, the EU's external relations have, become, have to become much more resilient and much more robust. We have to avoid uh, uh, dependencies. Uh, we have to diversify the supply chains. We have to ensure that we have strategic capacities in the sectors that really count. And cyber is a key element here. I think of the 20 biggest mm -hmm. firms uh, in the cyber area, uh, yeah, 18 sure. are either in, in yes. uh, US or in China, and only two are in Europe. And 90% of all data generated by Europeans are processed by American companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have the Brussels effect. What we call the Brussels effect is that our uh, norm, we are, Europe is the biggest exporter of norms and standards uh, because we have a very capable system for drafting these norms and standards, whereas the US Congress is incapable of deciding anything, basically, and China's norms and standards are not acceptable for the rest of the world. So this is a huge asset that we need to exploit, and we're exploiting it so far successfully. But it's not really sustainable unless we also have the substantive capacities. Because uh, as a share of, of the world economy, Europe's part will shrink. I think it's 14% now. This will go down. In terms of share of population, we are now at 7%, I think. Uh, and if, uh, if the real like... music plays in Asia, I think we cannot rely on the Brussels effect for a long time. So I think the Commission has understood this. There is more investment now in this area, producing chips. Uh, but clearly, we are far behind. And this is not just a question of economic power. Uh, cyber will determine how our societies are organized, basically. And if, if Europe is not out there, at the beginning, <laughs> we will basically be colonized, basically. <laughs> With luck from the US, bad luck from China. Talking about values and standards and architectures, uh, we had recently one very nice photo op, huge photo op in, in Prague, and it was called the Establishment of European Political Community, uh, where Mr. Macron was tweeting all day that he put the uh, heads of states, Armenia and Azerbaijan, on the table. We now see on Monday they will come to Sochi to see Mr. Putin. So um, talking about this kind of initiatives, can they be uh, something else than just you know, messaging in times of war or a seed for something in the future? It can potentially be a seed for something. Uh, now, I think it was somebody in Council of Europe who said that we already have this organization. It's called Council of Europe. Now, it is an organization without the United States and without, without uh, Russia, or uh, a meeting without them, to put it this way. Uh, in, we had this discussion also yesterday, I think, in the context of EU enlargement, some creativity to, way, to finding forums and political ways for different countries in Europe to engage is good, um, as long as it becomes more than a talk shop. Uh, so, so we'll see what comes out of it, anything concrete, because there can be too many talk shops as well. 
so, so uh, yeah, so my answer is a bit, bit mixed, uh, wait and see, but um, yeah. <laughs> it was very interesting because uh, Macron made this proposal and at this time the reaction by many people also in this region was this was supposed to be a substitute for enlargement because the, the French don't want enlargement and therefore they are inventing this to make this unlikely. Then in all the documents from the European Council, it always says this is not a substitute to enlargement. Yeah. But when uh, Mr. Macron spoke to his ambassadors on the 1st of September, made it, he talked about the European in political community, and, and he said, well, uh, it's very important that this is purely intergovernmental, that the European institutions don't play a leading role. And then he said, this constant enlargement has finally has to stop. <laughs> so in, <laughs> in a way, I think yeah. there's still this echo. But yeah. I do believe, I agree with you, it can be a very useful exercise as a talking shop, <laughs> because at the moment, in, in this current geopolitical situation where we are, it's very important to have a forum where the US, uh, you, uh, Russia and Belarus is not there and everybody else is there. This in itself is, can be very valuable. And I believe the meeting in, in Prague was good. It was very good that the next one takes place in uh, Moldova. Uh, and I think there's a potential there for a strategic discussion, but not in terms of doing anything very substantive because for doing that, you would need the commission. <laughs> <laughs> and you would basically duplicate a whole number of, ex uh, of initiatives that already exist within the framework of the European Union. Talking about security architecture of Europe, we'll talk, we have a lot of time uh, left, we'll talk about energy also, but I want to uh, uh, give the floor back to Thomas on something that Karsten said. You said basically that this war is uh, uh, um, trying to protect the security world order in a sense that we had it. You were... Uh, at the helm of OSCE. OSCE is in place when I was in Mariupol, in Kramatorsk, all around this line of division, how do you call it? You were there on the ground all the time since 2014, 2015, basically. In what regard do you see Ukraine involved in, in this new security architecture in Europe? Because that was basically one of the starting points of, of this uh, Russian aggression. Mm -hmm. Well, let me uh, first say, I think that the European security order uh, is, uh, of course, very different from how it was conceived uh, uh, throughout the Helsinki process, you know, starting with the Helsinki Final Accord, the, the Paris Charter, um, uh, the, the Istanbul Summit document, and, and, uh, and, and still 12 years ago in Asana, you know, heads of states of the OEC, they committed themselves to a um, uh, Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian security community. And, and obviously we are, uh, now we have moved to a system that relies exclusively on, 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 on deterrence. Now, uh, what you know, is the role of the OEC, uh, which, by the way, right now is, is fighting for its survival? Uh, one has to be uh, aware of that uh, in, in this uh, extremely uh, polarized uh, environment. Uh, and, and, and we'll have to see if there is enough political commitment to kind of maintain this institutional body uh, for, 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 for better days. I think what can the OEC offer? Uh, I think uh, in the short to medium term, if uh, there is one day again a, a ceasefire, uh, I think the OEC uh, has been in the past extremely good at monitoring, hmm? monitoring crisis situations, monitoring uh, ceasefires. And if there is a, a, a political commitment by the sides to relaunch um, uh, some sort of a successor of the special monitoring mission to Ukraine, I think this could definitely be uh, a function. A, a second role, uh, and, and here, um, you know, I would revert to a, um, a relatively uh, negative, but I think realistic scenario. If this kind of Cold War 2.0 that we currently already see coming is going to consolidate. You know, the OEC might then 
again resume functions uh, as in the 70s and, and the 80s, you know, basically offer a platform of dialogue between, uh, let's say, uh, Russia and the West without, you know, uh, uh, insisting on, on uh, uh, this entire body of principle and commitments that have been built up. And perhaps the third uh, um, role, and, and this is by far the most optimistic scenario, if indeed based on a, on a negotiated end of the war that is considered to be fair by all uh, uh, stakeholders, we, we, we try to build up again um, a more sustainable security order that relies on, on both uh, deterrence and detente. Uh, um, then uh, the OEC could again play a role when it comes to as a negotiation platform for confidence and security building measures, uh, sub-regional, regional arms control, but then eventually also for a more fundamental discussion, uh, discussion of the principles of European security. I think you know it's not enough at some point to call uh, states to recommit to the principles. I think that's necessary, but we will have to come to a new understanding what these principles mean today. And also we need to be honest enough to uh, uh, deal, tackle the dilemmas between these uh, principles, you know. Could I respond to the same question in a way? I mean, it all depends what kind of Russia we have on the other end, right? I mean, our strategic aim should be that Russia should join the democratic state and normal, become normal state again. <laughs> it, it's probably like very unrealistic right now, but that should be our, our future vision. And of course, in that case, all those things with the OSC and all these things, fine. In the meantime, uh, you know, we don't see that happen. The only way to have peace, stability in Ukraine is some kind of American security guarantee. That's the only way. Because, because if not, you will have continued uh, instability and, and, and threats. So, so unless, unless, until Russia is democratic, Ukraine would need to have some kind of a Western security guarantee. Um, in a way, you're already kind of, way all, kind of already there with all the weapons being provided, but it's not the direct commitment, it's kind of indirect. But I don't see, I don't see a stable peace there until these two, one of these two factors are in place. Talking about security, I've mentioned already energy, everything now is about energy, winter is coming, uh, it will be expensive to switch fast, we will have to take grip of ourselves, but talking about this energy resilience of Europe in this uh, uh, strategic future and talking about uh, materials that we need for that, that we saw also in COVID, how the supply chains are functioning and where, you know, the rare earths are. Uh, how do you see Europe coping with that challenge, which will be very huge? Well, it's something interesting to remember that uh, basically, Russia offered a way out of the energy dependence from the Middle East, <laughs> because that was the situation in, in the 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. the energy shock. Mm -hmm. And then people said, well, Russia is the solution. <laughs> but, <laughs> and now we are looking for a solution of, uh, for the Russia dependency on, on Russia, and, and we're looking to the Middle East, Qatar, and to the US in terms of LNG. Uh, I, Africa. And, and obviously, uh, I, I I think uh, the experts that I, I follow assume that we'll survive this winter quite well, unless it's extremely harsh winter, but that the real challenge will come when we have to uh, refill the storage facilities because this 40% uh, Russian share of, of uh, the EU's uh, energy supplies is very difficult to, uh, uh, to replace in the short term with LNG and other factors. In the longer term, we hope, of course, renewables will, uh, will be the alternative, but this will take a while. So there are some very serious people who will say the real crunch will come uh, in uh, 23. Uh, this could be a real tough winter. Uh, what you, you also mentioned, the, uh, if we go in the renewable direction, we might become dependent again. I think our parallel <laughs> panel parallel is discussing this that. exactly. Uh, and there's a huge dependence on, on, on Russia. I think about 90% of the rare earths that are absolutely vital in this field come from China at the moment. Uh, uh, there is uh, a risk that we replace one dependency on another one. But I think with the kind of benefit of hindsight, I think 
we, I hope we are more intelligent the next time. I mm. think for me, mm. the biggest failure of, of uh, EU energy policy in the last few years was clearly the fact that after 2014, we built another pipeline <laughs> to Russia and we didn't change uh, the kind of business model in this area at all. Uh, that was a huge I think, breakdown on, of human intelligence. <laughs> Talking about that, China is now official strategic rival of, of, of Europe. Uh, China is already there in Africa. We saw in the first days or just before the, the start of the war in Ukraine, this huge uh, summit of European and African Union. Basically, uh, Europe giving hand to take the energy uh, uh, from Africa. How do you see this? A uh, game being played on parallelly, which maybe people are not seeing. Uh, Russia getting ground in Sahel, Mali, Burkina Faso. So this pipeline for us and the pipeline of people. We all remember 2015 refugee crisis that was also a security uh, question for, for Europe. Maybe, I don't know, Karsten, you can pick up and we have a round. Could I, I would just before I answer, mm -hmm. can I, I would like to make a general comment on, you know, we're kind of facing the end of globalization. The globalization being that, we, you know, production is happening where it's the cheapest and the most efficient. And now it's become securitized because they don't trust the supply chains anymore. Like it used to be like medicine or, 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 or you know, or, or vaccines or now it's or 5G technology. So it becomes securitized. We don't trust anymore. We just want to buy from those we trust and we want to diversify. It's fine. The result of that is that you have less growth because you, you have less, less profits, so you less growth. So the, it's not the end of globalization, but it's less globalization mm -hmm. or regionalization or decoupling. And that is a little bit also this, what we see then in, in, in other parts of the world. It's kind of uh, whose side are you on? You know, are you choosing Huawei or Ericsson for your, for your uh, mobile phones, you know, for your FEM 5G? So this is kind of a struggle for the rest of the world taking place, I think, uh, which is partly about just money and, and, and access to markets, but also a little bit about, about values. Um, so, yeah, it, I can pass it on to you for, to answer the rest. <laughs> for strategic but, but, but I think it cannot China. be yeah. uh, in the interest of Europe, you know, to be uh, then fully drawn in into this division of, of the world and, and this uh, uh, this strategic uh, rivalry between the United States and, and, and China, I think uh, it can't be uh, in our interest. You know, to, 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 of course, it's a complicated equation. Uh, there are values uh, in there, um, uh, but uh, if we look at it from a, a political and economic uh, point of view, I think we, you know, we should kind of try to position ourselves uh, 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 somewhere uh, in the middle ground and, and not, uh, uh, you know, then be basically obliged, uh, you know, to choose the economic sphere that we can work in. And uh, I hope it's, 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 it's not too late for that. I think this brings me back to your blouse. Uh, yeah, yeah, really, yeah. that's a very beautiful blouse. And I was very much struck by... by Borrell's talking about the garden, Europe, and the jungle, the rest of the world. And I finally understood why the EU is still spending 40% of its budget on agriculture. <laughs> because we have to take care of the garden. <laughs> no, but what, and what we this, need a lot of water for this kind yeah, of garden. What yeah. this metaphor, I think, explains very well. It was very ill-chosen metaphor, and he was rightly criticized for it. But what explains very well how our worldview has radically changed. If you remember the neighborhood policy, the whole notion of the neighborhood policy was we would change our environment in our own image. We will support these countries, they will reform, we let them participate in bits of European integration, and when they are like us, problem solved, basically. And this turned out to be profoundly unsuccessful yeah. for reasons that are partly related to our own capacities and our lack of engagement and commitment, but also because of the global context changed uh, very radically. And now, instead of seeing ourselves as the vanguard of a better world uh, based on European values that we would export, we suddenly 
see ourselves as a kind of postmodern island in a sea of geopolitics. We've become very, very defensive. And the risk uh, of Borel's metaphor, and the risk of this attitude, is uh, this notion of fortress Europe. I, I think it's totally illusionary to believe that Europe can rely only on itself. We are totally dependent on others. And that the key between protection and protectionism, there is a very thin line. And I, I think that's absolutely crucial that we understand that we need others, we need to build a relationship. There are many countries in the world that basically share our values, that are on our side and who also wish to defend and develop the remnants of the multilateral order that still exists. So uh, this notion that uh, <laughs> the jungle is about to invade us is profoundly the wrong idea. If, if we have this idea, we're already basically out of the game. Talking about neighborhood and the jungle, I'll come to Western Balkans. Uh, and basically, the moment that we're living in, we won't talk about enlargement. There was a lot to talk about enlargement, but we'll talk about security architecture and Western Balkans as it is at the moment. As we saw yesterday, very crucial tension point, Serbia-Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, is the concept of neutrality still sustainable, as we saw with European common security and defense politics? And how do you see uh, Western Balkans in that security architecture? So we talk about EU common security and defense policy and NATO also. I can start. Um, first of all, neutrality. Um, Sweden and Finland were not neutral, they were just non-aligned. Yeah. It's an important difference there. Because yeah, because there were a lot of people, I'm glad that you made it point, because a lot of people didn't you know, uh, take this into consideration during yes. the discussion. Because as members of the European Union uh, and, and part of your European family, uh, you, you share values. Yes, okay. So in, that does mean that they've to just give them freedom, freedom to not engage in the conflict or war in case it happened, but doesn't mean that it automatically would be on the sideline if it happened. They could join, they could choose to join in. Uh, so, so uh, and that's, I guess, the same applies for Austria and, and Ireland and, and, and then should also apply for Serbia. Uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not black and white. And that, uh, you know, we're talking about the high-end security. You need to have these very formal alliances and military planning and integration, and you cannot, it's a very big difference if you're in or not. Uh, that's why we in Norway are super happy about Sweden and Finland joining. Not because we didn't trust them which side they would fall on in case it was a conflict. We knew that, but we couldn't prepare for it. We couldn't, we couldn't plan together. We couldn't integrate our forces in the same way we can do now. But that's the high-end thing. And lots of the day-to-day -day security we were dealing with it from cybersecurity, but all the you know, hostile takeovers or all sorts, of, all sorts of hybrid threats that you're talking about. NATO is not the player, it's the European Union. And there, uh, it's, it's, it's just an ever-going, ongoing task to, to redesign and update policies and cooperative mechanisms to deal with it and understand that you have state actors, non-state actors, and often using you know, uh, uh, secret methods. I don't know if you follow the news, but now they have arrested a spy in Norway, which is a Russian GRU colonel operating under a Brazilian passport. I mean, these this things happen now all the time. And, and, and it's not all about... the head of German security service, nevertheless, <laughs> being yeah, all right, in so, the so My point is that you know, security has so many layers and so many players. So there's a role for everybody. And it, to go back to Western Balkans, there, there's no reason why there shouldn't be strong cooperation on these things. It doesn't have to be politicized. Please. I mean, the, the straightforward uh, answer to your question uh, will for me be yes. I think neutrality uh, for a country that is in a geopolitically contested geography, um, I think, is, uh, could still be a, a valid answer. And neutrality, you know, implies uh, basically a, a number of uh, legal obligations. And beyond that, it's an extremely flexible, dynamic concept. And, uh, and I would argue that, uh, and, and you know, you can see with Austria, for instance, Austria uh, became neutral 
but uh, then joined the European Union. So uh, I think you don't need to, and you can also see uh, it at the country where I come from. Uh, I mean, we uh, continue to be uh, neutral, but at the same time, when it uh, came uh, to uh, adopting uh, sanctions uh, as a response uh, to a, a massive violation of international law, uh, we adopted a very comprehensive sanction package. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say neutrality does not mean that you need to uh, be indifferent when it comes to values and when it comes to defending international law. But as a, a concept, uh, in, in, seen from a security policy angle, it can still be uh, a valid uh, uh, concept. And I think uh, also, even though this is, of course, now very difficult uh, to advocate and to discuss, but uh, again, it, it might change again in a few months. I would remind you that um, the Istanbul uh, communique of the 29th of uh, March you know, suggested neutrality against security guarantees uh, that would have been multilaterally negotiated. I know this is now not uh, officially on the table anymore. Now it's something totally def different. Um, that you know, have been out, is outlined in this uh, Kiev Security Compact. That is a, a totally different, uh, of course, approach. Uh, personally, I have my doubts if this approach will ever, you know, uh, fly in this uh, geopolitical environment. But uh, we'll see. So the short answer is yes. Okay. Can I very quickly, I, I some, I, my impression is if Austria would invite a security expert from Mars, who to provide a strictly objective study of Austria's security conditions, etc. This person from Mars would, after a careful, objective deliberation, not recommend neutrality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because if what probably the person from Mars would say, mm -hmm. if you share the internal market, if you share a common currency, if you are so dependent with your partners in the European Union, probably makes sense to organize your security also together with them, basically. But uh, if he would present his study then in Vienna, he would be chased away because <laughs> more than 90% of the Austrian population is very uh, keen on neutrality, which is perfectly understandable because the success story of Austria after, the, uh, after 1955 is very much associated with neutrality. So I, I think we have uh, changed our constitution. We can participate in fully in European security policy. Uh, and I think we are, of course, but much less at, neutral than we used to be. But look at Sweden. <laughs> and Sweden yeah. also celebrated yeah. its, its, yeah. its non-alignment 200 years so deeply in the identity of Swedish, uh, Swedish foreign sure. policy. I think the and difference is like that, that in, in, in Sweden and in Finland you have an acute perception of a threat from yeah. Russia. And that is the game changer, basically. Yeah. Sweden gave up 200 years of its history, basically, in this regard. Yeah. But in Austria, there is no sense of such a threat. Yeah. Uh, we're surrounded by NATO countries, so this is seen very differently. But Switzerland? You, yeah, yeah, please do. <laughs> <laughs> but you from neutral Austria, uh, just to come back to my question, uh, seeing the frictions and the actors, what Karsten says, doing their job at the moment and all the critical points around Europe, uh, where do you see Western Balkans in terms of the security architecture with all these changes that we're seeing at the moment in Europe? I was quite sort of reassured by the visit of uh, Mrs. von der Leyen to the region, mm. because I, I think the timing is excellent. This is really necessary to do at this point, because I followed the debates here and I had all many discussions here with colleagues uh, in the coffee breaks, and uh, my sense is there is a lot of uncertainty here. Is the kind of uh, candidate status for Ukraine uh, and Moldova, is that something that can revive and re-energize also the Western Balkans uh, EU perspective, or on the contrary, is it just another big distraction which will monopolize all the attention and all the resources at the detriment of the Balkans? And I, I think from the Lions visit was very, very good because he, she provides very clear reassurance uh, that the EU enlargement's promise will be kept and these countries will be helped along. I think this notion that Bosnia gets a candidate uh, status is a very positive step too. And also I find it very important that she combined these visits with very concrete help on energy. 
Because remember COVID, uh, in COVID times, this, uh, the countries of the region had no access to, to vaccines. Uh, and finally, it's provided to Mr. Vucin, which is the wonderful uh, opportunity to share his Chinese vaccines and Russian vaccines with the neighboring countries. I think this case is not going to be repeated. This time, the EU shows its commitment uh, in very concrete terms, and I think that's a very positive uh, signal. Uh, one thing I wouldn't like, you know, Marta is not here with us, but I wouldn't like that we forget, and that is the concept of human security. You mentioned at the beginning, of course, war crimes at the end of the tunnel or, you know, being documented. Uh, uh, but we live in times of great uncertainty with climate change, with things going on, with food uncertainty, with droughts, with floods. Uh, we see, for example, in Afghanistan that basically combined with the conflict, direct conflict consequences, we do really have now climate change consequences that overpass those of the conflict. So where do we position Europe, who wanted to, uh, who loved to say that she is an exporter of security and development aid and everything, but now it's in peril, basically. I think this is a, a real risk and that uh, now this war has to has led us to refocus on, on hard security. Uh, and of course, this, there is also, and there is going to be a huge resource competition. Uh, I mean, you see uh, defense budgets um, exploding everywhere. We are uh, at the outset of a new arms race, uh, certainly in the conventional, uh, possibly also soon in the nuclear uh, field. And I mean, this is going to draw resources from somewhere. Um, so I think this is, uh, this is a, a real concern. Um, and, then, and then, of course, uh, the other concern that I uh, have is, is that this Cold War that we are moving into uh, is kind of making it impossible that we discuss uh, about important uh, transnational challenges and risks, uh, starting with climate change, uh, but also organized crime, uh, combating terrorism, extremism, all these transnational uh, threats. Um, uh, once we uh, stop talking to each other uh, on governmental level, it will be very difficult, you know, to cooperate. And, and, and of course, not to speak of the strategic stability agenda, nuclear, hypersonic, non-proliferation, -prolifer uh, space, new technologies, all these issues, uh, you know, they are urgent uh, issues that uh, should be uh, addressed. Uh, and where I think we have no other way than to, than to cooperate. And, and right now, in, in a climate of not only no business um, as usual, but for most areas, no business at all, this is a big risk. This, this war is, as I mentioned, about values and principles. So in one way, even if it does entail spending a lot of money on, on, on hard security, it also can at least be utilized in kind of refocusing what really matters. And, and if it's about democracy, it's also about uh, rule of law, about human dignity, all these things. And, and to bring us then back here again to the Western Balkans, if you get the wars can be re-energized as the, the enlargement process to focus on what really matters. You know, what are the most important things? What are the Copenhagen criteria? The most important aspects of, 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 of what Europe is about? media freedom, freedom of speech, these kind of things. If, if maybe something good can come out of that, we could be re-energized on the basic issues and maybe not so much emphasize lots of other technical stuff that only the technical people in the Commission understand. That would be, hopefully, that, I think, a, a good side effect of this conflict. Well, I, I think the trouble is uh, that hard power tends to crowd out soft power and values don't uh, turned into instruments in an ideological warfare, basically. I, I think if you reflect on what will determine the place of Europe in the year 2050, it's not going to be the outcome of the, Ukra uh, the uh, Ukraine war. It's going to be how we cope with cyber, how we deal with climate change, how we deal with migration. Uh, and the terrible thing is that, of course, uh, what is happening right now is uh, horrible distraction from, from these things that are, mm. that are really of existential importance for the future of Europe. And you think that Putin will be uh, 
he will not go further from this? I think we have no certainty. Uh, I think many of us have been uh, wrong in the run-up to the 24th of February because uh, we all felt that if uh, he does uh, a rational um, um, balance of cost and benefit uh, uh, of a military uh, operation, he would uh, come to the conclusion that uh, this is way too costly. And I think we see now that we, we've been right. Uh, it is so costly, but he did it anyway. So I'm not going to you know, uh, venture into saying that he's, he's not going to do it. But, um, and and I, you know, I alluded to different escalatory uh, options that, that he has. Uh, um, and I think we cannot exclude when he you know, comes uh, closer to facing defeat, strategic defeat, that then, uh, you know, in despair, he would uh, escalate matters. I uh, was one of those who saw the war coming, and because I work on hard security, as, as uh, you know, but the fact that it's gone so bad, that Russia is really, really using its resources, there's no capacity for Russia to do anything on the conventional side anywhere else. And it's really limited capacity left. So we'd have, so that, and, and that brings us to the nuclear. Um, and again, you cannot uh, kind of rule out anything, but let's just have a scenario if there was to use a tactical or so called tactical, which is like bigger than Hiroshima bomb, but nonetheless, okay, a bomb in, in Ukraine. It wouldn't change the war because it wouldn't, wouldn't make Russia manage to, to capture the country. It would isolate Russia even more because China and, and India would have to, to, to break completely with them. I don't think people of Russia either would I mean, buy it. So I think that would be the, if it was that desperate, it would also be the end of Putin very quickly, I think, <laughs> because you're all speculators. So uh, all those factors point against anything like that happened. I, uh, I don't see any way Putin can win this war. Um, it will be his beginning of his end. We just don't know how and when that end will happen. Stefan. Well, uh, I think there's this debate among historians whether it's structural changes that drive the course of history or whether it's personalities. I think what we've noticed on the 24th of February uh, can be personalities very much. And I, I think, as you say, the, uh, what he's done is profoundly irrational, and therefore we cannot count on... We hope that on the spectrum of craziness he is not all the way to do things that are totally desperate. But we, we can't be sure. We cannot be exactly. absolutely certain in this. There is huge uncertainty. And the only possible architecture that we know right now is there on the table is a new European Bauhaus. Security architecture in Europe panel, thank you so much. Stefan Lenne, please round of applause. <laughs> Thomas Greminger and Carsten Fries. The floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Okay. Hey everyone, we're just going to have a quick coffee break for 10-15 um, minutes. Um, please come in when the announcement, um, you hear it. And then we'll have our last panel, Kosovo and Serbia escaping the dead end. Thank you very much. <laughs>